Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Simon, and this is my Kelly colleague, Callum. Uh, we've come over from Canberra today to talk to you about a system that we've built for assessing aviation risk in Australian airspace. It's called the Airspace Risk Modeling System, or ARMS for short. So I want to start with a scenario, a hypothetical scenario. So let's imagine you're a commercial pilot flying in a, a commercial aircraft. So normally there are all kinds of controls in place to ensure that you maintain an appropriate level of separation uh, from other uh, aircraft in the airspace. But let's assume for a second that some of those controls are broken down. Maybe there's been a mechanical fault on your aircraft or another aircraft in the airspace. Maybe an air traffic controller has made a mistake or perhaps uh, another pilot in the vicinity has lost concentration for a minute and screwed something up. If you're really unlucky, some of these things might happen at the same time. An alarm flashes on your control panel and suddenly you see another aircraft approaching in the opposite direction. If you don't do something quickly, the two aircraft are going to collide and potentially a lot of people are going to die. You pull back hard on the yoke, breathing a sigh of relief as you narrowly avoid disaster. Pretty scary situation, right? That was close. But how close was it? What if the situation had been slightly different? What if the other plane had been travelling slightly faster? Uh, or if it had approached from a different angle? Maybe it had approached from above or below? These are factors which are quite hard to quantify when we talk about risk. Now, there are rigorous constraints placed on air travel to avoid these types of situations, and the pilot in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, however, given that the consequences of a collision like this could be devastating, we have a really strong incentive to understand and mitigate these risks as much as we can. So that is where ARMS comes in. Now, one of CASA's responsibilities is to assess the impact of proposed changes to airspace. So that can be things like changing routes which aircraft fly on, uh, services which are available to pilots, etc. Now, prior to ARMS coming along, assessments of these types of changes were qualitative in nature. They usually depended on the expertise of aviation safety experts. ARMS introduced quantitative data analysis to uh, these types of assessments. So ARMS now provides us with a set of figures and visualizations which helps us quantify the risk and really understand the, the risk in detail. Now, assessments in ARMS work in two broad steps. Firstly, the risk is assessed based on available data and the uh, location and time frame that we're interested in. We call this the baseline risk. Uh, then the assessor can also specify certain changes to the airspace, so hypothetical changes. And we call this a modified assessment. The purpose of this is really to observe the impact that potential changes make on the final risk. So what kind of data do we use to support these assessments? Well, it depends a little bit on the type of assessment that we run, uh, but overwhelmingly our most important data set for most types of assessments is our flight surveillance records data set. So this basically represents uh, data for all flights which take place within Australia. On a five second interval, we receive data for uh, the details of the flight, so identifying details for the flight and the aircraft. Uh, in, uh, locational information, long, longitude, latitude and altitude, as well as avionics information, so stuff, stuff like speed and heading. So uh, a couple of the engineers will probably have perked up at, at, the, at the mention of that. It, yes, it's really, really big. Um, so there are about 2.6 million flights in 2022 in Australia um, alone. And we have about five years worth of data and growing uh, as we receive more and more data from our provider. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the big data side of the solution later on in the talk uh, because we are dealing with, with some pretty big data here. Uh, in addition to our primary uh, data source here, we also have a range of reference data for various different assessment types. So some examples are shown here. Definitions of Australia's airspace structure, so what, are rule, what rules apply where. Uh, surveillance coverage maps, where do we have surveillance information and where don't we? As well as stuff like population density maps and, and other sort of geographic um, uh, rasters. I don't want to talk too long about the architecture of the solution, but I will give a quick overview. Um, I want to keep, uh, keep as much time for the actual geospatial stuff because I know that's what you guys care about. Uh, but, in, but really briefly, we've got a classic three-tier architecture for, for ARMS. Uh, we've got a big beefy SQL server on the back end. Uh, we've got a Python uh, risk modeling engine, which really does the heavy lifting. That's where a lot of the magic happens as far as ARMS is concerned. 
sort of pretty minimal front end built in, in Angular, a, a web UI, basically allowing us to collect information from users around the parameters they want to apply to the assessment and to then subsequently show the, the results of the assessment to, to our users. Underlying everything is the Azure Cloud Platform. I'm going to leave it at that for now, but I encourage you if you're interested in the, the details to come up and have a chat. So geospatial stuff. Uh, so geospatial analysis is really at the core of all of the assessments in ARM. Uh, everything, with the exception of SQL Server Spatial, uh, all of the, the geospatial technologies we're using in ARMS are open source. Uh, so the big one for us is GeoPandas. So GeoPandas does all of the data transformation uh, for ARMS, as well as uh, a fair bit of the analysis as well. On the analytics side, we're also getting support from libraries like Shapely, Fiona, GDAL, and Raster.io, where we're doing our raster analysis. For plotting, so for, for, for producing static map visualizations, uh, we lean pretty heavily on GeoPandas as well. It has some great built-in uh, native plotting uh, functionality. We're also getting support from stuff like Contextly for base maps. On the front end, we also use uh, open source geospatial, so open layers provides the ability for users to define and view their particular area of interest for an assessment. Uh, and OpenStreetMap provides useful context as well uh, in terms of uh, where and airports are located and the um, infrastructure around airports and, and a whole lot of other um, important information for our users. Uh, I'd be remiss not to mention QGIS as well on the desktop side of things. So as the, the developer, uh, I use QGIS extensively for prototyping purposes. Uh, so it's a pattern I'm sure a lot of people in this room are familiar with. I'll use QGIS for, for prototyping and then switch to Python to refine and automate the, the processes which, uh, which I've uh, tested. So let's go ahead and take a look at a real example of a risk assessment within ARM. Uh, so we'll focus on an example that looks at the airspace surrounding a controlled airport. So this would be a larger airport like Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane. Um, this type of airspace is typically categorised by a relatively high number of flights each day. And the aircraft tend to follow very similar patterns into and out of the aircraft. Usually aircraft are just doing the same thing one after the other. Now, ARMS actually implements different models depending on the airspace scenario being assessed. Uh, so the process that we show you in this example will be different from other types of airspace. And that's really to reflect the different characteristics that, of aircraft behavior in different types of airspace. So to start with, the user comes in, they access the system, they select the type of assessment they want to do, and then they see a screen that looks something like this. From here, they would choose a predefined airspace area from a, a predefined list. And of course, they get a preview of the airspace um, on a uh, simple web map here. For other um, types of assessments, the user might actually have to draw a, uh, a geographical area on the map, or they might uh, drag and drop a georeference file containing the area definition. Now here is where they specify the date range and altitude that they're interested in as well. Once they've done that, they move on to specify a set of modifying parameters. So after performing the analysis of baseline risk, the system will also apply the changes that are defined here to model their effect on the risk outcomes. Once those inputs have been provided, the assessment can actually begin. So let's take a look at how the assessment is actually completed. First step's a nice easy one. Here we just take the area and time frame that we're interested in run a query over our database and extract all of the points which fall into those parameters. Next, we use GeoPandas to group the points into flight trajectories. So what we end up with is a flight traject uh, a line string for every trajectory within the airspace. Now, since we know that the majority of traffic follows similar patterns or predictable patterns, it's useful if we can group the uh, flights together and represent groups with a single line string. Now clustering of this type is a very well researched area in academia. So we've adapted a process in our system and it looks like this. So first step's pretty simple. We start by interpolating and or extrapolating each trajectory such that all of the trajectories uh, within the uh, assessment have the same number of verti vertices. So basically the dimension, the dimensionality of each uh, trajectory is the same. Now this example is a little bit contrived, but you can see here that our horizontal trajectory has been interpolated such that it has 
four points like the rest of the, uh, the uh, trajectories in the airspace. So we then basically convert each of these trajectories into a feature vector um, representation describing the trajectory. So in addition to the location information, lat, line, and altitude for each trajectory, we also actually calculate some symmetries of interest uh, uh, within the, uh, the airspace area. This is based on a paper by Gary L. Uh, principal component analysis is then run over those feature vectors. Um, PCA aims to find a set of uh, dimensions which best describe the, the geometry as a whole. Finally, DB scan, the DB scan clustering algorithm is run over those resulting principal components. So DB scan groups uh, each trajectory into a, a group um, based on uh, sim having similar principal components. Uh, in other words, having similar ge geometry representation. Uh, not all trajectories will necessarily belong to a cluster in DB scan, so those that uh, do not belong to a cluster uh, are classified as outliers. So you can imagine that if you're looking at thousands or even tens of thousands of flights at once, this process can be really helpful to, to determine the groupings and speed up the whole process. So now what we have is a set of clusters and outliers. Our goal at this point is to determine the collision risk between individual pairs of aircraft. Now, of course, before we can do that, we need to identify pairs of aircraft that actually have a measurable uh, collision risk between them. So to identify those pairs, we're actually looking for three different things. We're looking for a case where two trajectories intersect each other, where two trajectories run parallel to each other and where aircraft are actually following each other. So intersections are pretty straightforward as you can imagine. They're found by running a spatial join over our set of trajectories and clusters. Uh, finding instances where two flights ran, uh, run in parallel for a certain period of time was trickier. We first started by running a simplification algorithm over the geometries that we had for our trajectories and broke them up into representative segments. Then we group the segments together according to their heading, such that segments in, in the same group were traveling um, in near parallel fashion. So you can see here, we've got the green and blue groups indicating rough parallelness. Finally, uh, we needed to identify pairs of segments which share uh, an orthogonal domain. In other words, you can draw a normal line from one segment to the other and uh, vice versa. This was hard to do, but uh, the way that we solved it uh, was to generate a square cap buffer for all of our segments. If segment A has a buffer which intersects with segment B and segment B has a buffer which intersects with segment A, then we know that they're orthogonally aligned and we already know that they're parallel and therefore that pair would be of interest to our analysis. So that's the identification of aircraft pairs taken care of. Now we can actually move on to calculate some risk. So I'm not going to get into the nuances of how the risk formula works here, but just at a very high level, it involves uh, representing the aircraft positions in space and time using Laplace distributions and then calculating the probability of overlap between them. And hopefully people with mathematics backgrounds vaguely know what I'm talking about there. Um, so when we do this, we also account for factors such as the speed of each aircraft um, and the approach angle and a few other factors as well. Now at this stage, we also calculate the collision risk within each cluster, and that takes care of the risk of aircraft following each other, which I mentioned earlier. Final step of the process, of course, is to aggregate all of those individual risks together, and that gives us a final risk estimate for the airspace. So once all of that assessment's done, the user gets presented with the outcomes of the analysis on a summary screen in their browser, similar to this one. Uh, the screen includes the calculated risk values. It also includes some summary statistics for the assessment. And importantly, it includes a comparison between the baseline and the modified assessments. They're also provided with some static visualizations of the airspace risks. So here are just some simple examples showing the geospatial and temporal distribution of risk as well as a uh, distribution of the actual risk for each of the intersection pairs. So this is really just one example of an assessment in ARMS. And what we wanted to show here was how we apply 
geospatial analysis with data science techniques to really efficiently complete these assessments in a timely manner. So before we finish up, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the solution from a big data perspective. So as I mentioned earlier, our primary data set, our, sur our surveillance data set, is very large. It's about 7 billion rows in, in size, or about 750 gigabytes on disk. Uh, the scale of the data set, particularly the number of records, uh, poses unique challenges at each stage of the data life cycle. I'm going to get into a couple of tips around big data um, in a second, but I did want to mention that we are still very early on in our big data journey, so we're, we're kind of aware that we haven't got the right, um, we haven't got the, the combination of techniques and, and technologies right just yet. But we have learned a few lessons along the way, and we've, we're starting to get some idea about where we're going next, which hopefully will be useful for you. So let's talk, start by talking about data integrity. Uh, so early on, uh, we naively assumed that our data provider uh, was sending us data of only the highest quality. Uh, that was not the case. <laughs> uh, we ended up spending a lot of time trying to fix issues with our data at rest, um, when, which when you have such a large data set can be really problematic. Eventually, we bit the bullet and incorporated uh, complex data validation against business rules into our ETL processes. What that allowed us to do was not only to ensure that we're not ingesting faulty data, which is obviously important, but equally importantly, it allowed us to get a more fine-grained understanding of what's actually coming across the wire and feed that back to our data provider. And they were able to fix a lot of those issues upstream, which is really the best case scenario for us. Uh, I've been beaten to the pump, <laughs> to, the, to the punch on this one. Um, Richard, uh, yeah, uh, basically summarised this better than I could ever summarise it. Um, but particularly for, for very large data sets, columnar operations tend to be superior for most types of analysis. Uh, luckily for us, GeoPandas makes this really easy because it's based on pandas. It natively uh, uh, vectorises a lot of the uh, operations that are applied to your data. It is worth mentioning that uh, it does depend on the type of analysis that you're doing and the structure of your data as well as to whether specific analyses are going to favour columnar operations or row-wise operations. So I'd encourage you to explore both options for your use case uh, and try it with uh, different sizes of data to observe how it scales before then scaling it up to, to um, production workloads. Lastly, this one's a little bit self-indulgent as a developer, but I think it is important to mention. Um, it's easy to fall into the trap of pre-optimization. Pre-optimization doesn't work at the best of times, especially using big data. There are good general rules to follow when developing code to work with big data, but trying to find the bottleneck uh, in your code ahead of time is usually a fool's errand. Instead, what I recommend is, one, write <laughs> something which works but isn't perfect, Two, use a code profiling tool, so in Python, something like C profile could be appropriate, uh, to identify the parts of your code which you're using um, more time or resources than you would expect. And three, aggressively refactor that bit of code, ideally until it no longer becomes, uh, becomes no longer the bottleneck, uh, if that's possible. If you do this uh, often and in a structured way, you'll find that it not only in improves the quality of your product, but it also makes you better as a developer because it teaches you the patterns and the anti-patterns to look out for, for for working with big data. So just to conclude this session, I want to talk a little bit about what's next for the development of ARM. Um, so we're going to continue to expand the types of airspace and the types of assessments that we can do within the, uh, within the tool. Um, so specifically over the next 12 months, we're going to introduce modules that can assess the risk between drones, between high altitude weather balloons and rocket activity as well. In early 2024, we're also planning to start making big changes to our data architecture. So details are still yet to be finalised, but it is likely we'll move away from an SQL architecture altogether and towards a data lake architecture. And we're hoping that this will give us significant improvements in performance and scalability as our database continues to grow. So that's all from Cal and myself. Thank you very much for listening to us this afternoon. Happy to take some questions. Otherwise, you can catch up with us during the break. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we'll have the questions now. Um, just raise your hand and a microphone will be brought around to you.
Hello. Um, how much work uh, do you guys have to do when someone, say, brings in a new airport or a new new runway within an airport? Um, good question. Um, so the the types of our the types of assessments we're doing um, we're not the only piece of the puzzle. So there's a lot of work that goes into that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people are thinking about the second airport at Sydney at the moment, yeah. <laughs> there is a phenomenal amount of work that goes into that. We are just one piece of the puzzle. So what will happen uh, for an introduction of an airport like that is you have all kinds of people working on it. We go along and we'll, do, um, we'll support that with, uh, with um, various risk assessments. So we'll look at the uh, impact of risk of other airports, of um, the risk at the proposed airport and do simulations and that sort of thing. Um, so very important to note that ARMS is not a decision making tool, it's a decision support tool. So the whole goal of ARMS is just to provide extra evidence to um, uh, go through that. Um, usually what will happen is people can just run the assessment themselves within the tool and it'll spit out the answer. There are cases where someone will come to us with something very unusual and then we'll have to do it as a bit of an ad hoc piece of work and how long's a piece of string uh, for completing that type of work. Just a quick question, how long does it take to run an assessment on, say, Sydney Airport? Yeah, it's uh, quite variable, as you can probably imagine, depending on uh, the time frame of interest in particular, and to a lesser degree, uh, depending on the, the size of the area which is under consideration. Uh, but typically, uh, we're looking at anything between about 30 seconds all the way up to, uh, we have had assessments that have taken like 20 minutes for like, you know, say, six months worth of data. Um, we're constantly, uh, one of the th things with this kind of thing is we're constantly working on trying to get those numbers down as well, particularly for very large assessments. Um, Sydney, typically, you'd be probably be looking at around two minutes for a, a modest size assessment. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mike. I've worked a lot with vessel monitoring than the VMS system in Australia, and I'm just wondering, I know you mentioned this is specifically around risk, but obviously there's a natural relationship there with early intervention and some of the kind of safety warnings or mechanisms and then knowing the kind of autopiloting functionality of planes versus that not being at all an option on ships and just wondering around what your kind of thoughts in that space is because there's a, a real pathway to significant uh, thresholds for people's safety and different things like that or even... Um, you know, managing the multitude of planes coming into a single space at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. I love your thoughts. I, I, I love that kind of thinking. Um, so originally we sort of built ARMS to do a very specific purpose and that was to assess um, the risk of introducing changes to airspace, which I, I, I spoke about during the talk. Um, since we've uh, released ARMS, we've had a lot of different people come to us and say, oh, could we also assess this? Could we also assess that? And could we also um, uh, assess this type of thing? And that is a perfect example um, of something that we could potentially do. Um, so we've already started working with various uh, people to introduce additional uh, uh, types of assessments in, in ARMS. And the three examples that I talked about there, literally where that came from, because we uh, spoke to people about their needs and that's what they came to us to. Um, so yes, in the future, we probably could introduce metrics and uh, measures that could measure um, that type of thing. I'm very much opening to, open to having those types of discussions down the road. Yeah, one, one interesting thing just to add to that, um, and it's, it's come out with some of our talks with people like Boeing, is that a lot of the methodologies that we've uh, developed here, uh, while they're oriented towards assessing risk, they're actually quite uh, easily applicable to stuff like efficiency, um, so looking at airspace efficiency, looking at how we can uh, have as many aircraft in a particular volume of airspace as, as possible and not have everything just turn into chaos. Um, so yeah, there's quite a lot of parallel sort of well, sidestepping that could, could be done into, into adjacent fields, I guess. We have time for them. <laughs> 